This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. What does it mean to be musical? 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 What does it mean? What does it mean to be musical? Why is music such a potent form of human expression? How do musicians select, interpret, and perform compositions? What's distinctive about the human voice? We've asked six extraordinary scholars and artists to explore the magic that is music. Welcome to UC San Diego. Welcome to the Conrad Prebis Music Center. Welcome to this, the sixth and final performance in the lecture series, The Making of the Modern World, To Be Musical. My name is Alan Houston. I'm the provost of Eleanor Roosevelt College. I am delighted to see each and every one of you here. The greatest treasure at UC San Diego is its faculty, the scholars, the artists, the researchers, the teachers, the people who make this institution hum and thrive with intellectual activity, the purpose of the series is to share them with you, to give you, parents and alumni, faculty and staff, members of the community, and through television and the internet, an audience worldwide, to give you a chance to experience what our undergraduates experience on a daily basis, the brilliance and skill of the people who work here. So our moderator for the evening to introduce Diana Deutsch is Stephen Cassidy. Stephen is a lecturer in Slavic and Comparative Literature. He's an Associate Dean of Graduate Studies, for a period of about six years, he was the director of the Making of the Modern World program. Tonight, he'll introduce Diana Deutsch. Please, Stephen Cassidy. Thank you, Alan. Musical illusions, perfect pitch, and other curiosities. Diana Deutsch is a renowned figure internationally known in the field of music psychology. It's a relatively new field, and I would say that her career spans most of its existence, and her contributions have probably helped to define the field as it is today. The most recent edition of her book, The Psychology of Music, it's kind of the definitive compilation of the latest research in the field of music psychology has just come out, and Professor Deutsch was kind enough to give me a copy, which I will treasure and also mark up um, extensively. The work that she's done, and what I think a lot of people, even from popular audiences, know about, is work on the illusions of sound, having to do with music versus speech, um, music perception, and her research on perfect pitch. And, some of these topics she'll be covering tonight, so I'll say no more about them. She has produced over 200 written publications, and that includes the book, The Psychology of Music. And uh, the compact discs that Alan Houston mentioned that are on sale out in the lobby, um, those are also two of her creations. They're compositions, though they illustrate some of the principles, the scientific principles that she's become so well known for. And she's won numerous awards, and the one that stands out to me is the Gustav Theodor Fechner Award, because Fechner was a very early practitioner in the field that uh, Diana Deutsch represents now. Um, American audiences know her and have known her for the last few years from her appearance on public radio's uh, Radio Lab. Um, musical language in 2007, pop music in 2008, and just a couple of months ago, earworms. Earworms are those nasty little melodies that get into your ears and don't like to leave. And I think she may be talking about those 
tonight um, as well. Now it's a great pleasure to welcome to the stage Professor Diana Deutsch. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Steve. So, um, let's start. This photograph was taken over 100 years ago by the psychologist William James and illustrates the profound influence of our knowledge about the world on the way we see things. When you first look at the picture, all you see is a jumble of blobs. But when I tell you that it's a spotted dog against a dappled background, you begin to see its nose, ears, tail, legs, and so on, until the entire outline of the dog emerges. Our stored knowledge of thousands of dogs we've seen in the past enables us to reconstruct this image correctly. Now, since William James's time, many similar examples have been created in vision. But sound perception also relies heavily on stored knowledge. And here's an example from music that I created. You'll be hearing a well-known tune, and it's played in such a way that the note names, C, D, E, and so on, are all correct, but the tones are distributed across different octaves. And I'll ask you to name the tune. You'll find the task is surprisingly difficult. <laughs> Okay, so that sounds pretty mysterious, right? So now here's this very same tune, except that now all the tones are in the same octave, and you should be able to recognize this without any difficulty. Okay, so um, now I'm going to play you the scramble doctor's version again and many of you will find that you can now follow it and confirm that in fact each note is correctly placed within its octave. F for some people it takes listening to it for a while for this to emerge but we'll try it. So hopefully some of you did in fact hear it correctly this time. So in these examples, the spotty dog and the Yankee Doodle effect, our perceptual system uses incomplete information to arrive at correct conclusions. We can go further and show that our knowledge, expectations, beliefs, and so on, can lead us to perceive things quite incorrectly instead, so that illusions result. And here's a musical illusion that I created, which is called the scale illusion. It shows that we bring our knowledge and expectations about sound to create patterns that are quite different from those that are really there. The sequence that's presented here is shown on the other part of the slide. And the sequence in the middle shows the same thing in a different way. And as you can see, the pattern consists of a major scale with successive tones alternating from ear to ear. The scale is played simultaneously in both ascending and descending form, such that when a tone from the ascending scale is in one ear, a tone from the descending scale is in the other ear. Now, when this sequence is played through stereo headphones, it's very rare for anyone to hear it correctly. The type of illusion varies from one listener to another, but the most common one is shown in the lower part of the slide. The correct sequence of pitches is heard, but as two separate melodies, a lower one and a higher one, that move in contrary motion. And furthermore, for most right-handers, the higher tones appear to be coming from the right earphone and the lower tones from the left one. When the earphone positions are reversed, the perceived locations of the higher and lower tones often remain fixed. And this creates the often unsettling impression that the earphone that had been producing the higher tones is now producing the lower tones, and the earphone that had been producing the lower tones is now producing the higher tones. 
The spatial reorganization of this pattern may not work too well with the sounds coming from loudspeakers in this concert hall because it's very reverberant, but I can certainly demonstrate the perceptual reorganization of the two melodic lines by playing first the entire pattern in stereo and then the pattern from each speaker separately. So first, here's the entire pattern in stereo. Now, here's what's coming from one speaker. And here's what's coming from the other speaker. And here they are both in stereo again. Okay, so now for a related illusion that I created more recently, which I call the glissando illusion. It's produced by a synthesized oboe tone that's played together with a sine wave that glides up and down in pitch. The two sounds are repeatedly alternated between the two loudspeakers, such that whenever the oboe tone is coming from the right, the glissando is coming from the left, and vice versa. Now, when both speakers are producing sounds, the oboe tone is often heard as jumping back and forth between the speakers, as we would expect. But the glissando appears to be joined together quite seamlessly. People localize the glissando in different ways. Um, Right-handers often hear it as traveling from left to right as its pitch moves from low to high, and then back from right to left as its pitch moves from high to low. And I'll play it now. Um, again, the effect of hearing the glissando travel slowly through space um, depends fairly strongly on the room acoustics and on the listener being somewhat centered between the speakers. But you should definitely experience the fragments of gl the glissando as linked together so as to produce the impression of a continuous sound. Now, here it is from the two speakers in stereo. Now, um, here's, here it is from one speaker alone. Here it is from the other speaker alone. Now here are the two in stereo again. So hopefully um, that one worked. Um, did you hear the glissando just join together as a single sine wave that just moved up and down? Whereas in point of fact, the sounds coming from the two speakers are quite, um, um, are quite different. Anyway, um, I'm going, I, I'll switch gears now and explore a different illusion that I discovered, which demonstrates that there can be enormous differences between people in how they hear even simple musical patterns. The illusion is produced by a pattern of two tones that's heard as ascending when it's played in one key, yet as descending when it's played in a different key. And further, when it's played in any one key, it's heard as ascending by some listeners, but as descending by others. So um, here's some background. It's clear that tones that stand in octave relation have a strong perceptual similarity. And this is reflected in our musical scale, which repeats at octave intervals. So that tones related by octaves are given the same name. So as you go up the keyboard in semitone steps, you play the notes C, C sharp, D, D sharp, and so on. And you continue this way until you reach the note C, an octave above, and you keep going with C sharp, D, um, D sharp, and so on. And you continue this way through successive octaves. And music theorists refer to the notes of the scale as pitch classes. 
And it's assumed that as you go up the scale, you repeatedly traverse the pitch class circle in clockwise direction, and at the same time you ascend a linear dimension of height. So having taken one full circle, one full turn around the circle, you end up on the same pitch class or note name, but now the note sounds higher. Now, this illusion that, that I discovered, which I call the Triton Paradox, makes use of computer-produced tones whose pitch classes are clearly defined, but which are somewhat ambiguous with respect to height. I wondered what would happen if you played a pair of such tones that are related by exactly a half octave called a tritone. What would happen, for example, if you played C followed by F sharp or G sharp followed by D, so you split the circle down the middle? What would happen? Now, here are some examples, and I'd like you to decide in each case whether you hear an ascending pattern or a descending one. And I'd like you to respond with a show of hands and also look around you so you can see that there are, in fact, huge differences between people in whether they hear this simple pattern as ascending or descending in pitch. Now, here's the first one. How many people heard this as ascending? Okay, so look around you, you'll, you'll, you'll see, okay, about half, I don't know. Okay, how many people heard it as descending? Oh, many more. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, good. We have, we have great disagreement here. I always like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, here's another one. How many people heard this as ascending? Okay, how many people heard it as descending? Okay, more people heard this one as descending too, okay. Ascending? Descending? Well, that was about 50-50, okay. And last one. Ascending? Descending. That's interesting. Okay, so all will be revealed when I explain what, <laughs> okay. Now, th this, is, this is of course interesting, particularly if you're a professional musician and you would believe that surely um, what you hear is going to be the same w um, as what your next door neighbor is hearing, who's also a professional musician. After all, it's just a pattern of two tones that are separated by a half octave, and yet you get these huge individual differences. Now, the remarkable thing is not only are there these radical differences, but the pitch classes um, arrange themselves with respect to height in a systematic way. Tones in one region of the pitch class circle are heard as higher, and tones in the opposite region are heard as lower. Now, to plot the way um, a listener hears the tritone paradox, I generally use the following procedure. Tone pairs such as you just heard are presented in a haphazard order such that each of the 12 tones within the octave serves equally often as the first tone of a pair. And the listener then judges whether each pair of tones forms an ascending pattern or a descending one. The percentage of times that the listener hears the pattern as descending is then plotted as a function of the pitch class of the first tone of the pair. And these are plots which are typical of those that I obtain in my experiments. And you can see that each subject showed an orderly relationship in terms of um, whether they heard um, which pitch, which notes they heard as ascending, which notes they heard as, I'm sorry, which pairs they heard as ascending and which pairs they heard as descending, which translates into which notes are heard as higher and which notes are heard as lower. But notice also that the direction of the difference varies considerably from one person to another. So, for example, if you look on the upper right of the, of, of the slide, you'll see that the, the, uh, the one on the, um, if you look on the right-hand part of the slide, you'll see that the um, upper graph is very, very much, very different from the lower one. 
Um, and um, here are, here's an example, here are two examples from people who heard the Triton Paradox very clearly. And you can see that what the first subject heard was pretty much the opposite of what the second subject heard. Um, so for the first subject, the notes G sharp and A were the highest notes for that person. And for the second subject, the notes C sharp and D were the highest notes. So how can, how can this happen? So I conjectured that each person has a mental representation of the pitch class circle, which is oriented in a particular direction with respect to height. And the way the circle is oriented is derived from speech patterns to, to which he or she has been most frequently exposed. This mental representation then determines both the pitch range of the person's speaking voice and also how he or she hears the Triton paradox. And in fact, in a further experiment, I found that there was indeed a correlation between the pitch range of a person's voice and how they hear this pattern. And there's a further line of evidence. I'd noticed informally, well, first of all, actually, I was very puzzled because I happened to be hearing the pattern in a way that was opposite to that that most people who were subjects in my laboratory were hearing it. And that made me very uncomfortable. I was wondering, you know, was I crazy or, you know, what was the matter with me? And this kept happening. So, for example, the very first pattern that you heard, I clearly hear as ascending, but most of you here hear it as descending. Um, and that was the way it, it was going. And then I went on a lecture tour in Europe, and I found that different audiences had different flavors of what they, might, what they were hearing. And I remember I went to Brussels, where they, the, the, um, um, a very large concert hall there, and everybody was hearing what I was hearing. It was just wonderful. So I thought, oh, great, you know. Was, yeah. So, um, and then I thought, well, could it, there's a geographic difference here, so could it be something to do with pitch range of speech? And so I tried to find people from the south of England, which is where I come from, and I played them this pattern, and sure enough, um, they were hearing what I was hearing. And in a formal experiment, in point of fact, people from the south of England ge generally hear the opposite of people from California. <laughs> um, when a person from the south of England hears the pattern, when, one way, pe the pers person from California hears it the other way. At least this is English-speaking, native English-speaking Californians, and this was, a f uh, this was actually a few decades ago. And of course, demographics have changed now. Um, but it still seems to hold that, judging from this audience, that m most, people, most people in the US tend to hear something rather similar to what Californians hear. Um, so, for example, this is data from Boca Raton, Florida, and you can see that it's fairly similar to the Californians. This is Stevens Point, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. Again, similar pattern. On the other hand, here we have McMaster University um, in Ontario, and we find that the students there heard what the people from the south of England had heard in my earlier experiment. So, um, assuming the perception of the Triton paradox is determined by a learned speech-related template, when in life does this template develop? In one study, we found taking a group of subjects who'd all grown up in Youngstown, Ohio, um, that differences emerged between those whose parents had also grown up in Youngstown and those whose parents had grown up elsewhere in the US. For want of better words, we designated those subjects whose parents had also grown up as Youngstown as locals and those whose parents had grown up elsewhere as aliens. <laughs> as you can see, the two groups produced very different distributions of peak pitch classes. And this finding indicates that a person's pitch class template might be formed in childhood. So in another experiment, I studied 15 subjects together with their mothers. 
And the subjects were all Californian, but their mothers had grown up in different geographic regions, including England, the European continent, and various parts of the US. As expected from our earlier findings, the mothers perceived the Triton pa paradox in ways that were very different from each other. And although the subjects were Californian, their perceptions corresponded closely to those of their mothers, and so also differed considerably from each other. So this slide shows as examples the judgments made by two young children who'd both been living consistently in San Diego and who perceived the Triton Paradox very clearly. It's interesting, you can play this to young kids and they have no difficulty at all deciding whether they're hearing the pattern ascending or descending. As adults can sometimes say, well, I don't know, maybe I hear it one way, maybe I hear it the other, maybe I hear it both ways, etc. Kids, no problem at all. And the graph on the left shows judgments made by a seven-year-old girl together with those of her mother who'd grown up in the south of England. The graph on the right showed the judgments made by a six-year-old girl together with those of her mother who'd grown up in California and Hawaii. And you can see that both these children produced very pronounced patterns which were strikingly different from each other and appeared as stronger versions of those of their respective mothers. So, Assuming the perception of the Triton Paradox is determined by a learnt speech-related template, when in life does this template develop? Specifically, we can ask what happens in the case of young adults who've been exposed to one language in infancy and later acquired a different language. Will such people hear the Triton Paradox in accordance with their first language or rather in accordance with the language that they now speak? So to examine this, we tested subjects whose first language was Vietnamese and who now live in California. The, fir um, the first younger group arrived in the US as infants or young children and they all spoke perfect English and most were not fluent speakers of Vietnamese. The second older group had arrived in the US as adults. These all spoke perfect Vietnamese but little English. And we had a third group which consisted of English-speaking native Californians, both of whose parents were also English-speaking native Californians. And here's the distribution of peak pitch classes produced by the two Vietnamese groups combined um, together with the Californian group, and you can see it's quite different. And this slide shows the um, distributions of the older Vietnamese group and the younger Vietnamese group, again together with the Californians. Now statistically, both Vietnamese groups were um, significantly different from the Californian groups. On the other hand, there was no difference at all between them statistically. Okay. So appears that the language or dialect to which a person is most often exposed in childhood has a particularly strong influence on how the tritone paradox, which is a musical pattern, is heard later in life. And more generally, it points to an influence of speech or language on how we perceive music. So now I'd like to go further into the relationship between speech and music by examining the mysterious no man's land between the two and showing how fragile the boundary between them can be. Composers throughout the ages have played with relationships between speech and music, either by composing music that has some of the qualities of speech or embedding short segments of speech in musical context. In particular, the composer Mussorgsky had argued that music and speech are in essence so similar that with practice a composer could even reproduce a conversation in music. And he wrote in a letter to Rimsky-Korsakov, whatever speech I hear, no matter who is speaking, my brain immediately sets to working out a musical exposition for this speech. So in our next demonstration, speech is made to be heard as song. And this is achieved without transforming the sounds in any way or by adding any musical context, but simply by repeating a phrase several times over. Demonstration is based on a sentence on my CD, Musical Illusions and Paradoxes. And um, again, I discovered this by accident. I was um, working on post-production of, of this uh, CD commentary and um, 
I suddenly heard what seemed like a strange woman had entered the room and had begun to sing. It was a little bit scary, actually. Um, and I, I, I quickly realized that, in fact, that wasn't the case, but it was my voice now coming out of the speaker's bit. Instead of sounding like speech, it sounded like song. So anyway, here's the example. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. But they sometimes behave so strangely, they sometimes behave so strangely, 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 so strangely, so strangely. So it's rather like this. Okay. Now listen to the full sentence again, and this is exactly the same as the one you first heard. You might find that it begins by sounding like normal speech, just as before, but when you come to the phrase that had been embedded in it and repeated, I appear to be bursting into song, and here it is. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. Now, most people find this transformation quite striking. A school teacher in Wisconsin, Walt Boye, sent me a video of his fifth grade class listening to this segment, and as you hear him say, this was the first time they'd ever heard it, and notice that halfway through the repetitions, the children begin to sing along with the, pray, with the phrase. Good morning, Mr. Who? Boyer. That's right. Would you all wave and say hello, Professor Deutsch? Hello, Professor Deutsch. Uh, Professor Deutsch, I just explained to this class what I think might happen by listening to the next example, but I haven't told them or we haven't, they haven't heard any examples yet. So just to give you a little background as you're watching this uh, video or DVD, I'm, I'm going to try to make it into a DVD for her. Uh, they've never heard the example. I feel like I'm a magician. You've never met me before, have you? you know? uh, so let's see if you can hear what I think you're going to hear, you guys. <clears throat> The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. But they sometimes behave so strangely, they sometimes behave so strangely, sometimes behave so strangely. Try it. Sometimes behave so strangely. Go ahead. Sometimes behave so strangely, sometimes behave so strangely. 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 So strangely. So strangely. So strangely. So strangely. So did you hear the melody? Yeah. So strangely. Was she ever really singing though? No. So why do you think it happened? So in a formal experiment, it's rather difficult to really nail this down formally, but we recruited 11 subjects who'd had experience with singing in choirs or choruses, though none of them were professional musicians, and we tested them individually and had them listen to the full sentence followed by the phrase repeated 10 times. And we asked them to repeat back the phrase exactly as they'd heard it. And here are the productions of six of the subjects played in sequence. And remember, they were repeating my spoken phrase. Sometimes behave so strangely. 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 Do that again. Okay. Well, at all events, here is a chorus of all the 11 subjects. Now, 
remember, they were tested individually and in isolation from each other, and the sounds were later mixed together. Okay. So you might then ask, well, maybe these subjects were hearing the phrases sung the first time they heard it anyway. In fact, when I first came out with this, there was quite a discussion. Some people said, well, she was always singing. And so, but no, I wasn't. Um, uh, but the problem is that once you hear it as sung, you continue to hear it as sung. And this can go on for months and months, okay? <laughs> At all events, we checked into this by recruiting another set of 11 subjects on the same basis. And instead of playing the phrase repeatedly, we played this phrase only once and then asked them to um, repeat what they heard. Sometimes behave so strangely. 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 So clearly they were repeating it as speech, okay. And here's the chorus of all 11 subjects. Sometimes behave so strangely. So after that, to make sure that these subjects were able to repeat the pictures, because one could say, well, maybe the second group of subjects didn't know how, to, couldn't repeat the pictures properly. So we had them then listen to the phrase as sung, and then we again asked them to repeat back exactly what they, they heard. And here are their renditions. Same subjects. Sometimes behave so strangely. 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 You, you may notice that the subjects are having a lot of difficulty inhibiting themselves from laughing. There's something sort of very, very sort of um, uh, funny about having to sit in front of the experimenter and then repeat into a microphone, sometimes behaves so strangely. But anyway, they got through it. So um, it's evident anyway that when the phrase is heard only once, it's perceived as speech rather than song. But when the phrase is repeatedly presented, it comes to be heard as song. The precise reason for this strange effect is unclear, but it does show that it's possible to cross over the perceptual boundary between speech and song without changing the physical parameters of the sound in any way. Now I'm going to talk about perfect pitch, which points to another relationship between speech and music. Now, as we know, perfect pitch, which is otherwise known as absolute pitch, is defined as the ability to name or produce a note of given pitch in the absence of a reference note. And this ability is very rare in the US and Europe, though in contrast, the ability to judge the pitch of one note in relation to another, known as relative pitch, is very common among musicians. Now, viewed from a very broad perspective, it's very strange that absolute pitch should be so rare. So we can take the naming of colors as a comparison. Supposing we identify a color as, say, red, we don't view it, we don't do this by viewing a different color whose name we know and then evaluating the relationship between the two. Um, for example, supposing I showed you this. And you said, well, I can recognize the color and I can discriminate it from other colors, but sorry, I just can't name it. So, Supposing I then juxtaposed it with this, and I said, this is blue. And then you said, well, okay, so if this is blue, then that must be red. That whole interchange would be pretty strange. So it's always seemed to me that the real puzzle concerning absolute pitch isn't why a few people possess it, but rather why it's so rare. The motivation for our studies came from a chance observation I made a while ago that speakers of Vietnamese were very particular about the pitches with which words were spoken. When I tried to pronounce a Vietnamese word, they either thought I was trying to say something entirely different from what I intended, or they had no idea at all what I was trying to say. <laughs> but when I got the pitch right, the meaning of the word immediately became clear to them. 
So essentially, these speakers were using absolute pitch in the process of assigning meanings to words. Now, standard Mandarin is better codified than Vietnamese, and with some exceptions, it involves just four tones. And please excuse my bad pronunciation as I give you an example. The word ma, when spoken in the first tone, means mother. In the second tone, ma means hemp. In the third tone, ma means um, horse. And um, in the fourth tone, ma is a reproach. So when speakers of Mandarin hear the word ma and attribute the meaning mother, when they hear the word ma and attribute the meaning horse, they're associating a pitch or a sequence of pitches with a verbal label. And in the same way, when people with absolute pitch hear the note F sharp and attribute the label F sharp, or when they hear the note B and attribute the label B, they're also associating a pitch with a verbal label. Now, if speakers of tone languages use absolute pitch as a cue to determine the meaning of words, then we would expect them to refer to stable and precise pitch templates in reciting the same list of words on different days. In one experiment, we gave Vietnamese speakers a list of 10 words to read out on two different days, and we calculated the average pitch produced by each word on each day. So here's an example. So I've interleaved the words in uh, time. So first you hear um, word one on day one, followed by word one on day two. Then you hear word two on day one, followed by the same word on day two, and so on. And notice how very, very similar they are. La, la, ga, ga, ki. Chi, giả, giả, lạ, lạ, nghe, nghe, hát, hát, đòi, đòi, tặng, tặng, đá, đá. So, as you can hear, this is just remarkably similar, okay? Now, here's a list of 12 Mandarin words spoken by a speaker again on two entirely separate days, uh, interleaved in the same way. Huang Huang Jing Jing Mei Mei Xing Xing Jie Jie Guo Guo Shan Shan And in fact, of the Mandarin speakers, one third of them showed averaged pitch differences between the words of less than a quarter of a semitone, which is remarkably small. And as we might expect, speakers of English were significantly less consistent in the pitches with which they pronounced a list of English words on two different days. So these findings indicate that speakers of tone language possess a remarkably precise form of absolute pitch, at least for spoken words. And this led me to conjecture that absolute pitch, which had traditionally been viewed as a musical faculty, originally evolved to subserve speech. And I further conjectured that when infants acquire absolute pitch as a feature of their native language, and they later reach the age at which they can begin taking music lessons, they then acquire absolute pitch for musical tones in the same way as they would acquire the tones of a second tone language. And in contrast, children who'd instead acquired a non-tone language, such as English, would need to acquire the pitches of musical tones as though they were the tones of a first tone language. Now, it's generally accepted that it's extremely difficult to acquire a first language beyond early childhood. So on this line of reasoning, children who'd acquired a non-tone language, such as English, should be at a severe disadvantage in acquiring absolute pitch for musical tones when they're past early childhood. 
So this leads to the further conjecture that the prevalence of absolute pitch from musical tones might be far higher among musicians who are speakers of tone languages than among those who are speakers of non-tone languages, such as English. And we examined the prevalence of absolute pitch in two large groups of music students. The first group consisted of 88 students who were enrolled in a required course at the Central Conservatory of Music in Beijing, and these all spoke Mandarin. The second group consisted of 115 students who were enrolled in a required course at Eastman Student uh, School of Music, and these were all non-tone language speakers, mostly English. For both groups, all those who were invited to take the test agreed to do so, so there was no self-selection of subjects from within either population. And our test for absolute pitch consisted of the 36 notes that spanned the three octave range from the C below middle C to the B almost three octaves above. And here's a sample of um, six notes taken from this test. If anyone here got these, please talk to me, come and see me afterwards, because I'm, I'm trying to recruit subjects with absolute pitch and it's really difficult. <laughs> we, we divided each group into subgroups by age of onset of musical training. And to be conservative, we considered only those subgroups that contained at least nine subjects. And this slide shows the percentage of subjects who obtained a score of at least 85% on the test for each of the subgroups. As you can see, both the Central Conservatory group, that is the Mandarin speakers, and the Eastman group, that is the US non-tone language speakers, both showed orderly effects of age of onset of musical training. The earlier the age of onset, the higher the probability of meeting the criterion for absolute pitch. You can also see that for all levels of age of onset of training, the percentage of those who met the criterion for absolute pitch was far higher for the Central Conservatory group than for the Eastman group. And if we relax the criterion for absolute pitch by allowing for semitone errors, as you can see, the Central Conservative Group did even better, um, while the Eastman Group stayed pretty, pretty low. Okay. So the striking difference between tone and non-tone language speakers found here supports the conjecture that if given the opportunity, infants can acquire absolute pitch as a feature of speech, which can then carry over into music. So I'm hypothesizing that for speakers of tone language, the acquisition of absolute pitch during musical training is analogous to learning the tones of another tone language. Now, it could be argued that these findings instead indicate a genetic basis for the capacity to acquire absolute pitch. So we set out to tease apart the influence of language background and genetic heritage here. We explored the prevalence of um, absolute pitch among students at USC Thornton School of Music. There were 203 subjects in the study, and again, there was no self-selection from within the, the population. We gave them the same test as in the earlier study, and also gave them a questionnaire that inquired into their linguistic background. And based on their responses to the questionnaire, the subjects were divided into four groups. Those in groups intonation, where Caucasian reported that they spoke only non-tone language fluently. The remaining subjects were all of Chinese or Vietnamese descent, and they were assigned to three further groups in accordance with their responses to the questionnaire. Those in group tone very fluent reported that they spoke a tone language very fluently. Those in group tone fairly fluent reported that they spoke a tone language fairly fluently, and those in group tone non-fluent responded, I I can understand the language, but don't speak it fluently. And this slide shows for each subgroup the average percentage correct for our test for absolute pitch. And we can see that the subjects who spoke a tone language very fluently showed a remarkably high performance on this test. Indeed, their performance was far higher than that of the non-tone language speakers. It was also far higher than subjects of the same ethnicity who didn't speak a tone language, that is the tone non-fluent group. 
And it was higher than that of the tone fairly fluent speakers, which was in turn higher than that of the tone non-fluent speakers and of the non-tone speakers. So, and the performance of the tone non-fluent speakers didn't differ statistically from that of the non-tone speakers. So these findings show that language controlling for ethnicity is indeed a strong factor in the predisposition to acquire absolute pitch. And most recently, we gave this test to 160 students at the Shanghai Conservatory of Music, and this slide shows our results, both with semitone errors allowed and also semitone errors not allowed. And you can see that those who had begun musical training at age five or younger scored an average of 83% correct on the test, not allowing for semitone errors, and an amazing 90% correct, allowing for semitone errors, which indicates a remarkably high prevalence of absolute pitch among these students. So finally, the question arises as to why a few non-tone language speakers develop this ability, while most others with equivalent age of onset and duration of musical training don't do so. We conjecture that if a child who's first learning to speak a language such as English has an unusually strong ability to hold sounds of spoken words in memory, he or she would be more likely to develop the connections between pitches and their verbal labels that form the essence of absolute pitch. So we recruited 27 English speakers, seven of whom had absolute pitch. The subjects had all begun musical training by age six, and the absolute pitch possessors and non-possessors were matched for age and for age of onset and duration of musical training. And we tested their memories using the digit span, which measures how many digits a person can hold in memory and recall in correct order. And we presented the strings of digits either as spoken words or as numbers on a computer screen. And as shown here, the absolute pitch possessors substantially outperformed the non-possessors on the audio portion of the test, while the two groups didn't differ significantly on the visual portion. So it appears that an unusually strong memory for spoken words could foster the development of association between pitches and their spoken names early in life, and so facilitate the acquisition of absolute pitch. And as a further interesting aspect of this, the auditory digit span has been found by other researchers to have a genetic basis. So the large memory span for speech sounds we found here could give us a clue to the genetic contribution to absolute pH. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank all the people who collaborated with me in this series of experiments. And thank you. Thank you very much indeed.